Hi, I'm Joe Zeidel, Chief Investment Strategist at Blackstone. I welcome to our Q2 webinar, Slow Growth for Longer. I'm joined, of course, by Byron Wien, Vice Chairman of Private Wealth Solutions and Investment Strategist. Welcome, Byron. Good to be here, Joe. Over the course of this webcast, Byron and I will take you through themes key to the second quarter and beyond, and at the same time, share our views on the current macro environment. We'll also leave plenty of time for your questions. With that, thank you for joining us. And Byron, before we begin, maybe you could address the 15% gain that we've seen year to date in the S&P 500 and why the easy returns might be behind us for the year. At the beginning of the year, Joe, as you'll remember, we thought the whole year was going to give us 15%. And now we're just into the second quarter and we've already gotten essentially the 15%. So the, at the beginning of the year, the market was undervalued at less than 15 times earnings and sentiment was very negative, an ideal set of conditions for a strong market rally. Today, the market is more fully valued and sentiment is optimistic. It's not euphoric yet, but it's optimistic. So I think the returns between now and the end of the year are going to be more limited. Yeah, and I think we'll be seeing more of a tug of war between central bank liquidity on one side, which we'll talk about here, and then also the difficult earnings environment that we're coming into. And that tug of war likely will create the volatility and, and hence maybe even some opportunities to, to deploy assets as the year goes on. Well, great. Well, thanks. And let's hop into it, Byron. And I think we'll start with the 10 surprises and maybe you want to go over uh, some of those. Yeah, well, I don't go, want to go over the, the whole list, but I will talk about one and two. Um, number one, the Federal Reserve, I, at, at the beginning of the year, we didn't know exactly what posture they were going to take, but now they're on, clearly on hold, and we don't think they're going to raise rates at all during the year. And on number two, there you see, we thought the S&P would give us 15%, that we thought that there would be corrections along the way, and I think the corrections are ahead of us, um, but we think that uh, we'll make it to the 15%, but we don't think we're going to have 30% or even 20% for the full year. And then if you go to the next page, um, we think March 29th is going to come and go without it, you know, it's already come, come, come and went. Um, but we think there will be a soft Brexit deal, probably not another referendum. But if there were another referendum, we think it would be to remain. So that argues for a soft Brexit deal. And finally, one, one we've gotten wrong, we thought there'd be some uh, uh, blockbuster findings in the Mueller a report and there don't seem to be any, and that makes a Trump second term more likely. Well, great. Let's look at the radical asset allocation for a minute too. If you take our viewers through that, yeah, it's always worthwhile going through it. Um, we have five percent global multinationals, no change there. Fifteen percent in U.S. long only. Uh, we up that from ten to fifteen. Five percent in Europe. 10% um, of the emerging markets where we still think there's opportunity. China is up more than 30% already this year. 5% in Japan, we reduced that from 10 to 5. 30% continuing in alternatives, 10% each in hedge funds, private equity, and real estate. Nothing in gold, 5% in natural resources, we think oil is set at higher in price. And then here's the radical part of it, 15% in non-conventional fixed income, essentially equity-like fixed income, like mortgages, leveraged loans, uh, some high-yield bonds, some emerging debt, some mezzanine financing, and finally 10% in cash to take advantage of opportunities as they develop. At the beginning of the year, as you see, sentiment was very negative, a great opportunity to buy. Uh, but now sentiment is optimistic. It's not yet euphoric, but it's optimistic. And as a result of that, we think the opportunities going forward are going to be more limited. 
Well, let's turn to the economic environment for a minute. And we'll start off with this chart, which is looking at the growth in major economies. And the point here is that it's expected to slow in 2019. And you can see uh, Japan, uh, the European Union, advanced economies, the United States, as well as China, are all positioned to slow in 2019. There's only a handful of countries or economies that will actually see growth improve, such as uh, an India on this slide. But that slowing growth environment is something that um, is going to continue to come into play because it's going to push central banks around the world to ease uh, or provide greater liquidity. 2018 was a year of coordinated uh, global growth or coordinated global expansion. 2019 seems more like a year of, simul of a simultaneous uh, slowdown. Now, turning to Europe, the big three, uh, which would be Germany, France, and Italy, are either in recession or headed close to recession, as you can see from this chart on real GDP growth. Uh, Italy is formally in a recession. They hit it in the first quarter of 2019. If there's any silver lining or consolation to Italy being in recession, it's that they have a lot of experience with recessions. They've had three since 2008. Uh, but you can see here, uh, France and Germany are moving very close. Now, this is looking at GDP, which of course measure is backward looking. But when you look at the forward indicators, things like the PMIs and other leading economic indices, what you, what, what you see is that there is further weakness to come from both Germany and France. And again, that does put more pressure on the ECB to be a provider of liquidity. Now, China, of course, has been the big global growth story. And as you can see from this chart, just seven or eight years ago, China was about a third of global growth. Uh, but today, it's closer to 44% of global growth. And China is, of course, slowing down. As you can see from this chart, their real GDP and industrial production are levels that haven't been seen in decades. Now, that, of course, has pushed the, the uh, central bank in China to introduce about $2.5 trillion worth of various different forms of stimulus, or $2.5 trillion renminbi worth of various different forms of stimulus. And that is starting to have an effect, and you're starting to see some uh, green shoots, if you will, out of the China growth story. Now, this next chart, I think, is really going to form the basis of one of the major themes in 2019. And as I said before, you know, this year is shaping up to be this tug of war between central bank liquidity on one side and a difficult earnings environment on the other side. And what this chart looks at is the um, balance sheet reduction of major central banks. And what you can see is that the major central banks out there are slowing the size of their balance sheet reduction. In other words, the tightening that we saw in 2018 is going to give way to easing in 2019. Last year, 56% of central banks around the world hiked rates and the monetary base contracted. This year, we think the ECB is going to be forced to be providing liquidity. The Fed has moved into dovish territory. And of course, uh, the People's Bank of China is going to be increasing their stimulus uh, in order to arrest the decline of growth there. Now, this is a chart that we look at that we've titled The Market Goes Up Until the Fed Stops. And it's one that we've highlighted a few times over the course of these webinars uh, since the beginning of last year. And the point here is that, you know, generally speaking, the market likes when the Fed is hiking. Now, of course, the Fed has told us that in 2019 they're going to be on pause and, and they are moving more into dovish territory, such as ending the balance sheet reduction. And as those bonds start to roll off, we believe the Fed will reinvest them at the shorter end of the curve, which is likely to drive down shorter rates and cause a, a, a curve steepening. But if you look at where consensus is today, consensus thinks that the next Fed move is actually going to be to, to cut at the end of 2019 or beginning of 2020. Uh, I, we think that there could still be some Fed hikes left because of some strength in the economy as well as some inflationary pressure. So the point here is I don't think we're ready to say this is the end of the Fed hiking cycle. So therefore, we expect an environment that continues to remain pretty good for equities over the long term. Now, a lot has been made over the last few weeks over the inversion of, the, of, of one portion of the yield curve, the 10-year to three-month. Uh, but the thing I would highlight about that part of the yield curve is it's not the most predictive part of the yield curve. In order to have the 10-year, three-month produce reliable signals, you've got to do a lot of manipulation to get there. So, for instance, there are some people that say that the yield curve or that portion of the yield curve has to invert for 10 consecutive days. Other people say it has to average a 15 basis point inversion over 10 weeks to be a viable signal. My point is that if you're looking at the 10-year, three-month, which did invert, it can be pretty noisy. The more reliable part of the curve is the 10-year, two-year spread. And it is very flat today, but the point we would make in this chart is that that part of the curve can actually stay flat for a long time. 
uh, from 1994 to 1998, you can see a period of about 44 months where the yield curve was pl pretty flat before ultimately inverting. We could easily stay flat here. In fact, we could actually re-steepen because there are things that the Fed can do in order to re-steepen the curve, such as reinvesting on, on the short end, uh, but also generally signaling to the market that they'll let inflation run hotter, which would push up the long end of the curve. So the point here is that the 10-year, three-month is a warning, but it's only a warning in that when that part of the curve inverts, the rest of the curve normally follows suit just with a lag. So I think we could remain with a flat yield curve between the tens and the twos for a long time and still have pretty good conditions. Now, Byron, let's turn to you and look at some of the, uh, you know, what we would call the recession monitor checklist. Okay, so here are four things that we look at that are sort of signals to us that we're, we have trouble ahead. When average hourly earnings gets to 4%, uh, that usually means that inflation is alive and well. But it's only 3.4%, and it's going up, but it's going up very gradually. So that one isn't with us. In terms of leading indicators, that one had rolled over last year. But the recent data on leading indicators is it's headed back up again. So that one is sort of confusing, but at this point in time, it has rolled over. The yield curve, Joe just commented on that. And I would say that it gave a false signal with the 10 year three month, uh, but it isn't giving a signal now. And on sentiment, um, it, we're optimistic, but we're not euphoric. And I think we'll be euphoric before we're done. I think what we have to recognize, and this is uh, controversial, is that the U.S. economy was growing at 3% before the Great Recession. Now, R Reinhardt and Rogoff point out that when you have a recession that's both an economic recession and a financial uh, collapse, uh, it takes a decade to get out of it. Well, we've been in it for a decade, but, and we are out of it, or at least we were 2.9% in real GDP last year. But in my judgment, uh, that was because of the stimulus. I really think we're going to be growing at 2%. If you look at the next slide, you can see that growth in the U.S. is really the sum of non-farm productivity growth, which I think is going to be about 1%, and population growth, which is going to be another 1%. So my view is, going forward, we shouldn't expect growth of more than 2%. We're a mature economy, and if we can grow at 2%, that's good. That doesn't mean that'll satisfy Donald Trump. One of the reasons he wants the Fed to lower rates is so the growth will be closer to the 3% that he promised the American people when he was elected. Now let's look at one of the major components of, of the U.S. economy, and I think a source of growth, and that's the U.S. consumer. And the U.S. consumer, of course, is the largest part of the economy. And what this chart looks at is average hourly earnings. And this is something that Byron just mentioned a minute ago, that historically, when average hourly earnings hit 4% or higher, that becomes a pain threshold for the Federal Reserve. But where we are today with average hourly earnings, we're moving up at about 3.4%. And the early stages of uh, that earnings growth or, or pay growth is actually very good for the consumer. It's good for the economy. The thing I would highlight here is that this is only one third of a very pro-consumer story, right? That average hourly earnings have moved higher. The second component of it is that uh, we are working more hours. In 2018, the number of hours worked was above that of 2017. So not only are people earning more per hour, but they're working more hours. You multiply them together, it becomes an income proxy. And it basically argues that between higher hourly wages and a longer work week, the U.S. consumers actually, or the U.S. workers actually experienced something north of 5.5% in terms of an income proxy growth. The third component to this consumer story is, is, of course, the tax cut from last year, that most of the country woke up in 2018 with the benefit of a tax cut, and that's got long-term consequences for, for many parts of the country, consumers in many parts of the, of the, uh, of the country. Now, we did mention that we think wages are going to continue to go higher. 
Internally at Blackstone, our portfolio companies are reporting higher average hourly earnings across those CEOs that respond to our surveys. And looking at the broader economy, we think that wages will continue to move up as well. And what this chart here highlights is the number of work stoppages, or call it strike days. And in 2018, the number of strike days was the highest in 30 years. So in other words, workers are flexing their muscles. Now, there had been this narrative post the great financial crisis that said workers hadn't been experiencing pay hikes or or wage increases because they'd simply been happy to maintain their jobs. And that might have been true at the early stages of this recovery, that people were just happy not to have been fired, so they weren't asking for more pay. But when you look at the number of strike days here in this chart, what it tells you is that workers out there are demanding more money, whether it's Marriott workers in San Francisco, teachers in LA or Arizona or other parts of the country, I think this argues that you're going to continue to see wages moving higher. Now, last point on the consumer story is that credit remains very, very good. There are very few credit delinquencies. As you can see from this chart, the trends here for the consumer remain pretty good, and I think they'll continue to get better. Now, Byron, let's turn over to corporate profits. Maybe you can address a couple slides here. Okay, well, this one um, is, is particularly relevant because in this quarter, um, we're, we're likely to see uh, a tough time. The first quarter of 2018 was a good quarter for earnings. The first quarter of first 2019 is likely to be a tough one. Nevertheless, um, this shows that uh, earnings for the year could be up 7.6%. I, I definitely think we could be up uh, 5% or maybe a little bit more. I think people are too negative on earnings. And uh, while there may be some negative earnings surprises this year, I generally think that the ability of the S&P 500 and corporations in general to show a positive earnings trend will continue. It isn't gonna be anything like last year. Last year was an earnings up 20% year, but we'll have earnings up 5% this year. So the economy and corporate profits are still growing. Yeah, and that's that tug of war that we described, which is central bank liquidity and maybe a resolution to China trade on one side, but the reality of much slower earnings growth on the other side. In 2017, earnings growth was up about 10%. 2018, as Byron mentioned, earnings growth was up 20%. And in the first quarter, we could actually see earnings growth zero or maybe even slightly negative. Uh, so that is the uh, potential or the potential catalyst for volatility. Now, this is a troubling one because uh, on the left-hand side, you see that uh, repurchases of corporate stock have already exceeded the level they were at at 2007. Uh, corporations have a tendency to buy at the high, sell at the low. And this year, uh, or this chart shows that, that uh, right now is no exception. Uh, they were buying stock in 2007 and selling it in 2009, or at least buying fewer shares. And the same is true now. And uh, corporate stock being bought is about 3% of the value of S&P 500. But it isn't coming from tax cuts. It's coming heavily from repatriations. It is shown on the right-hand side. And in terms of the use of the savings from taxes and repatriation, part of it is going to buybacks, part of it is going to increase dividends, and part of it is to other uses. But not a lot of it is going to capital spending yet. That's still disappointing. Here is my dividend discount model. Uh, as you, some of you know, I developed this in the early 1980s when I was still at Morgan Stanley. And it's based on the principle that if you know what the S&P is going to earn and you know where interest rates are, I can tell you where stocks and bonds are equally attractive. So if the S&P earns 170 this year, which I think is a good consensus number, and uh, the 10-year uh, treasury is 250, uh, then we get an equilibrium point of 3,500. Um, so we would all um, be glad to see that. But this thing, this model is very sensitive to interest rates. 
if interest rates even go back to 3%, the equilibrium point drops from 3,500 to 2,758. And um, so watch interest rates, because if they do go back up, I think the market, the market is vulnerable. Uh, but right now, what they're saying is, at these interest rate levels, stocks are still attractive. Let's look at a couple of things that might dry, drag, uh, drive the last leg of the cycle. Uh, and this is on the subject of uh, tariffs. And the idea here is that we could get some resolution from China trade. And if that does happen, we could see a savings, uh, not, of, not only from the removal of existing tariffs, uh, but we could also see some savings from, by avoiding further escalation. Uh, so if we do take the China trade issue off the table, there could be a total uh, combined savings between existing and further escalations of over uh, $226 billion in 2019. Now, that could also feed through to another very, very important part of the economy, and that's small business confidence. Uh, and what we'd seen here, what this chart highlights is small business sales growth expectations. In other words, uh, how small businesses are looking at their sales growth uh, outlook. It's another measure of confidence, if you will. And there tends to be a very strong correlation between small business confidence and GDP. As you can see here in this chart, uh, the correlation is over 0.7. And the message here is as small business confidence goes, so goes the economy. Small businesses employ about 50% of the workforce in the United States. So we've seen that confidence measure roll over. We know that first quarter uh, GDP growth is, is going to be weak. Traditionally, the first quarter is the weakest quarter of the year, uh, going back over the last decade in the post-financial crisis uh, era. Uh, but whether or not growth will drop uh, from here or for the remainder of 2019, I think it's going to have a lot to do with CEO confidence. So if we can get China trade and some other things behind us, I think there's the opportunity for this to rebound. Now, this chart looks at CapEx, and as Byron said just a minute ago, CapEx has been a little bit disappointing, but what's important here is that it is on the rise when you're looking at a year-over-year -year percent change. And one of the areas that we have seen CapEx going to is intellectual property. Now, that's a little bit different from prior cycles because normally, when you think about CapEx, you think plant, property, and equipment. But we know with a decade of below-average growth, our companies are not having to solve for um, more equipment. They're not needing to solve for increased production. Capacity utilization in the U.S. economy is barely back up to the 50-year average, and it's still below what we saw in 2008. So the CapEx isn't required to expand production. Instead, CapEx has been going toward intellectual property. Think about this as software. Why? Because what companies are forced to solve for today is not more equipment, but it's a lack of people. And if you look at small business surveys out there, Companies that say the inability to find qualified workers is now the highest in the history of those surveys. So in other words, all around the country, companies are saying the same thing. They can't hire qualified workers. So what do they do? They take their CapEx budget and they plow it into intellectual property, i.e. software. That also increases efficiency uh, and should increase profitability. Absolutely. And the second thing here is housing. And we think housing is going to continue to pick up uh, steam. There's a strong correlation between um, the 30-year uh, mortgage rate and mortgage origination. The correlation is 0.53. And with the 10-year Treasury yield having drifted down from 3.25% last September to uh, you know today where it is at about 2.5%, it means that the mortgage rates themselves are plateauing or even coming down. That's going to translate into origination activity, and that goes to new home sales. It goes to a combination of new and existing home sales, but the real driver for the economy is new home sales. When you have an existing home sale, you're basically transferring some asset from one person to another, and it means you're going to make a few trips to the hardware store, but the economy really benefits from new home construction. And that's because for every new home that's sold, a builder is typically now going to start on another home to replenish the inventory, and that ends up being bullish. Now, this last section, we're going to focus on a couple things to watch. And the first is that uh, global sovereign debt continues to be at very low yields, and there's about $38 trillion uh, of outstanding global debt. And as you can see, the vast majority of it uh, is yielding less than treasuries. Uh, in fact, about $11 trillion is less than zero, another $6 trillion between zero and 1%. 
uh, and then uh, about $3.7 trillion between 1% and 2%. So over 50% of global sovereign debt out there is yielding less than treasuries. That will keep a long-term lid on treasury yields. Now this chart looks at treasury demand. And the point I would argue here is even though we have a lot of sovereign debt yielding less than treasuries, I think there's still the opportunity for some upside pressure on the 10-year treasury yield. And in our 10 surprises for 2019, one of the things that Byron and I noted is that the 10-year treasury yield could go as high as 3.5%. What's going to get it there? Well, there's a combination of things. Number one, just generally growth. Number two, inflationary pressure, where I think there is the potential for some wage inflation. Wage inflation tends to be pretty highly correlated to CPI. And the third thing that can provide some uh, provide for a higher 10-year Treasury yield is supply and demand. On the supply side, we know we've got over a trillion dollars that we're going to issue this year. We'll issue a trillion dollars next year, most likely. And what this pie chart highlights is the major buyers of Treasuries. Social Security, the Federal Reserve, China, and Japan. Those are the four big buyers. They're not exactly buying more. In fact, the Federal Reserve's been shrinking its balance sheet. China and Japan aren't buying more. So then if you go beyond the big four, you're left with Brazil and Ireland. But look at the cliff that you're falling over here, that you're dropping off. Japan at one trillion, and then Brazil at 300 billion. So it's not as if Brazil and Ireland are capable of stepping up to be the swing buyer of treasuries. That creates a supply-demand mismatch. Now, what this chart highlights is about the same, the same data, but a slightly different way. And what it shows is your three big buyers of treasuries. Uh, we know that foreign holders uh, have uh, stopped buying more treasuries. In other words, their treasury holdings have basically plateaued. We know that the Federal Reserve is buying less. Their holdings are going down. And what that leaves is the U.S. household, the individual uh, saver. And they would have to buy treasuries at a rate that they've never bought before in order to maintain equilibrium prices. So to sum up our views on the 10-year Treasury yield, it's this. We acknowledge that there's a lot of debt outside the U.S. at very low rates, substantially below ours. Yet there are factors in place that could cause the 10-year Treasury yield to go higher, and I think that will be the direction for the remainder of 2019. Now, Byron, over to you for a couple other slides. Okay, we always like to show one that's kind of a surprise, and this is certainly in that category. You can see here back in 2011, uh, the unemployment rate for those who had um, achieved a college education uh, was a little over 4%, but the unemployment rate for those who didn't uh, complete college, had less than a high school diploma, was 11%. Um, and so there, there was a 7% differential. Now there's a 4% differential. The tightness of the labor market has really benefited those who haven't uh, got a full education. And um, we think that's going to continue, but that's good news, and it should uh, serve the problem of inequality well. Going to the next slide, um, the male worker has uh, uh, fallen into a better position. Uh, you can see here the participation of males 35 to 44 is about uh, 64 percent. And the, for the total uh, labor force, it's about 63 percent. So the average male has had an easier time finding a job. Now, just commenting on the overall employment situation, you know, when only 20,000 workers found jobs in January, uh, I guess in February, uh, we were worried. But now with uh, 195,000 finding jobs in March, we, we, I've begun to think that somehow there are a lot of people who have opted out of the workforce who are coming back in. So, you know, the unemployment rate is 3.8%, and you would think that would make things very hard. But if wages keep high inching up, uh, I think the workers will turn out to be there. All right. And let's move to the question and answer portion of the uh, webinar. And we did receive a few email questions. Uh, so we'll go through this list. And of course, if there are questions that we don't get to, we always invite you to email us. And I'll provide that information at the end of the webinar. 
Um, so the first question, Byron, uh, it's on the, on the presidential nomination contest, and maybe I'll, I'll turn this one to you. And the question reads, as the 2020 uh, presidential contest heats up, the candidates so far seem more focused than ever on proposals for economic reform. It's still early. There's still a lot of ideas that are going to be uh, kicked around here. But do you believe any of these new ideas have staying power? I do believe that the country is shifting from the center right, uh, which elected Donald Trump, to the center left. Uh, right now, the polls that we're looking at show, show the Democrats are in a pretty good position to win um, in uh, 2020. Uh, but I'm not quite convinced at this point. It's pretty hard to unseat an incumbent president if the economy is doing well. And you and I believe the economy will be doing well next year. And Donald Trump has a lot going for him. He cut taxes. He dismantled regulation. We're not going to war with North Korea. We may not have gotten all we want from them, but we're not going to war with North Korea. Um, and those are three important things that persuade the electorate that he isn't all bad. Uh, so my view is that you can't beat somebody with nobody, and I don't see anybody among the 16 declared Democratic candidates who can beat Donald Trump as long as the economy is doing well. 16 declared as of today, but that's probably not going to be the final number. There will probably be more people coming into the And I think the that's bad. I think that uh, hurts the focus uh, on any a few candidates. Uh, right now, according to the information I'm looking at, um, <clears throat> you know, the obvious, the ones I would have expected to be in the lead, uh, Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, and Elizabeth Warren. The one, uh, one that I think has a good chance is, um, the, uh, is Bernie Sanders. Uh, I think the other ones, uh, Beto O'Rourke, uh, who doesn't have an enormous uh, amount of uh, opportunity uh, uh, or experience, um, uh, I don't know how far he'll get. Um, and uh, uh, the mayor of uh, South Bend, uh, Pete Buttigieg, um, uh, he has uh, the television appeal and uh, some administrative experience. Uh, but I think what we've learned from Donald Trump is if you're photogenic and you come across effectively on television, you have a better chance than an experienced, uh, seasoned political type. Now, there's one name that didn't come up in that answer, and that was Joe Biden. How is Joe Biden sitting on the sidelines or late to declare? How is that either either good or bad for, you know, just generally the Democratic side of the of the contest here? I think Joe waited too long to declare, and I think it's hurt him uh, because he hasn't had a team to deflect uh, some of the gender issues he's been accused of. And also, um, I, you know, I think he's uh, not been able to put together the kind of people who can really uh, manage his campaign effectively. So we'll see whether he declares or not. Uh, but I think uh, recent events have made him made it less likely that he's going to do it. Well, good. Well, let's get back to the email questions. The second one uh, is, as the wave of IPOs of so-called unicorn tech companies is underway, uh, it's leading some to draw comparisons to the dot-com boom of the late 1990s. Uh, in our view, how legitimate are concerns about a bubble? And maybe I'll start with this and, and certainly invite you to, to hop in the discussion. Uh, generally speaking, what ends a bull market. Uh, if you look at every single bull market we've had over the course of history, there's a few things generally that will appear at the end of a bull market. You know, that is number one, an inverted yield curve, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, number two, you could have extreme overvaluation, something that we saw in the late 1990s with the tech boom. And then number three is euphoria. And I think as we look at a wave of IPOs or the potential for the IPO market to heat up, uh, this is one of those beginning signs that you could start to see euphoria. I don't think we're there yet uh, because when you look at individual investor flows and other traditional measures of sentiment, you see that there's still a healthy uh, degree of skepticism. But nevertheless, watching that IPO market heat up is one of those signs that we would look for that says, okay, we are in a late cycle environment. And by the way, that does make sense given that we're 10 years into a bull market, the longest bull market that we've ever had in history. 
And by June of this year, we will be in the longest economic expansion that we've seen uh, in history. Uh, Byron, anything to add there? Uh, no, I, you know, my feeling is that some of the, uh, uh, some of the FANG companies uh, are having uh, terrific earnings, if I'm right, and the S&P 500 only grows 5%. Some of the FANG companies are going to grow 15 to 25 percent, and I don't think they're dead yet. Good. Well, the next email question is on uh, employment markets. We touched on this a little bit already in the broadcast, but we'll, we'll go through the question here uh, and, and add a few other comments. The question reads, unemployment remains near record lows uh, and average hourly earnings continue to creep up, but many worry about a broad market sell-off as uh, sentiment uh, turns more bullish. How real is the risk that investors interpret weak Q1 earnings as a clear sign of a slowdown uh, despite strong fundamentals? And what I'd say here is I think this goes back to the tug of war, where you've got central bank liquidity and the potential for China trade on one side versus an earnings headwind on the other side. And when you look at um, the central bank liquidity, it's a long-term secular story. And that basically pushes off the end of this economic expansion. In other words, the central bank easing, not only in the United States where they've turned dovish, but globally, is going to put a floor on the global economy. And it means that the recession is not going to start or the recession is going to be pushed out further. So how that relates to earnings is really important because we can see an earnings slowdown in 2019. I think we will, as Byron covered the, the data already. But it means that the earnings slowdown is not going to coincide with an economic slowdown. And when you get an earnings recession at the same time as an economic recession, it's a very bad outcome for equity performance. But if you look since 1945, about 40% of the time you get an earnings slowdown without a corresponding economic slowdown. In other words, it's like a mid-cycle earnings pause where earnings slow or turn negative, but the economy continues to to expand or creep along. And when that happens, you actually tend to get pretty good equity performance. So if we do see you know, weaker markets despite the stronger fundamentals, I think it ends up turning into a buying opportunity. Now, a couple last questions here. Um, amid the ongoing chaos surrounding negotiations, the market appears confident that a no-deal Brexit will be avoided. In fact, the pound is up more than 2% this year and reached a nine-month high in March. Are investors letting wishful thinking getting the best of them? Byron, are we going to see a, a soft Brexit or a no-deal Brexit? What are the things that might go right and what might go wrong here? Well, the thing that can go really wrong is if there's no deal. Uh, because then uh, Britain is just out of it. It has to pay a fine. And uh, I, I think there would be chaos. And I think the policymakers uh, realize that. That's why uh, uh, Theresa May is trying to do a deal with Jeremy Corbyn uh, to bring in the Labor Party. I think somehow a deal will be done. I, at this point, I can't tell the shape of it, but I do think a soft Brexit is going to come about uh, sooner or later. But it'll probably take a while before, it come, before it's affected. Mm -hmm. And from an investment perspective, it's worth pointing out that the Brexit, you know, is the equivalent, you know, what the UK is dealing with the Brexit is the equivalent of, you know, what the United States dealt with in Y2K, right? If you go back to December 31st, 1999, we were trained to believe that computers would stop working, that infrastructure would shut down, and that the lights would not turn back on. Uh, and of course, we know what happened. January 1st, 2000 rolled around, everything was fine. In the UK right now, people are projecting the worst in a Brexit. And my guess is, and this is certainly just my belief, and feel free to, to disagree, Byron, but my view is that 12 months from now or, or, or 24 months from now, whatever the UK looks like is probably not as bad as what people projected to be today. So in other words, this might be the equivalent of their Y2K moment where people uh, have basically panicked through 2019. Uh, but my guess is whatever the UK ends up looking like, it's probably not going to be as bad as people think, right? That's what I think, but that may be wishful thinking. <laughs> we might be letting wishful thinking get the best of us, yeah. according to this question. Well, the last question here, Byron, is investors now believe that there is a nearly one in three chance of a rate cut this year, uh, while the predicted possibility of a rate hike has fallen to zero. Is a cut in 2019 at all likely? Does the economy run the risk of overheating if the Fed cuts? Well, it does, I think, uh, and our view is that the signs are improving. 
and the economy is going to be better in the second half. Uh, so the chances are greater that there's going to be another hike than there's going to be another hook, uh, cut, at least the way we see it. So um, I don't think the Fed is going to take the risk if, if we're right and the economic fundamentals are improving. Right. And one of the things that we know from the history of the yield curve is this. When one part of the yield curve inverts, as the 10-year, three-month did uh, a little bit uh, just a few weeks ago, what normally happens after that is the data actually starts to improve. Equities normally rally. And then the third thing that happens is people come out of the woodwork and start to discount or dismiss the value of the yield curve. And so far, we're seeing all three of those. Uh, so I would say stay tuned, but from our perspective, the bull market is not over. Now, thank you, Byron. And thanks again, uh, everyone who tuned in with us today. In closing, I'd like to remind everyone that our next webinar will be July 11th. And lastly, if there are questions we didn't get to, or if there are other concerns or feedback, please let us know at blackstonestrategy at blackstone.com. Again, that email is blackstonestrategy at blackstone.com. Thank you, Byron. Thanks, Joe.